In this lesson, we're looking at natural selection mechanisms, and there's quite a lot to this, so it's really important that we are taking some notes. All right, we all know from our work in Unit 3 that a population of organisms will show really strong similarities between features. They are the same species after all, but we know that every individual within that population won't be identical, right? Because variation exists. Variation is beneficial. It's vital to the long-term stability of the species. It allows organisms to withstand and survive sudden changes which may arrive in the environment. And this variation arises from independent assortment, okay, from recombination during meiosis, from random fertilization, of the gametes, but also from mutations that occur to create new alleles, and it also uh, changes in the way that genes are expressed, like in epigenetic changes. Now, a population is a group of individuals of the same species living in the same geographical area, and they're interbreeding to create new offspring. We know that genotypes underpin the phenotypes, and that reproduction transfers those genes, and therefore the phenotypes, into new generations. We know that mutations add more variation to the mix as well, be it for better or for worse, right, with detrimental mutations. But all of these opportunities to create variation within a population of organisms contribute new alleles to the gene pool, and the gene pool being that entire range of genes and alleles present in a population. The range of variation available in a gene pool depends on the range of alleles present for each individual gene. If genes only have one possible variety available, that's it, just one, then that obviously can't contribute to variation because everyone has the exact same trait. These are known as fixed genes and about 80 to 85% of our genes are actually fixed. So when we're relying on you know, our genes for evolution or for changes, we're relying on 15 to 20% of those genes to contribute variation to our species and therefore how our species evolves and microevolutionary changes arise from this small scale variation within a species and you know where the offspring are the same species that's that microevolution now gene pools are subject to so many external influences and they're shaped by the movement of individuals and the environmental conditions and all those kinds of events. Things like the mutation rate, the reproduction rate, immigration, emigration and the environmental changes, they're all going to impact the frequency of different alleles in a population. Microevolutionary changes occur in a number of ways. We're talking mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, natural selection. Okay, and that is going to change how frequent an allele appears in that population, and they're the four we're focusing on. Mutations create new alleles from old alleles, and although the mutations created can be detrimental or can you know, produce recessive genes that hang around for many generations, they're ultimately always a source of variation, which is generally beneficial. So new alleles from old ones. Gene flow is the random movement of alleles in and out of a gene pool as individuals join and interbreed and allele frequencies change. I want to stress this random point though, okay? They're def these gene pools are defined in terms of reproductive and genetic isolation, so gene flow is a good thing. Immigrant populations bring in new alleles, right? And this is why we say this is a random movement of alleles. The immigrant Pop individuals can move in, bring new alleles, um, emigrating organisms might move out and take detrimental alleles with them, or just change the frequency of others. So either way, uh, gene flow between populations actually keeps the size of the populations approximately similar, um, whereas when a population becomes really isolated, then they can, they can shrink in numbers. Genetic drift describes random changes of allele frequencies in small populations, those which don't see much gene flow at all. So again, we're seeing ge uh, random change, but it's talking about populations with minimal gene flow, so small in numbers. Now, every reproductive event involves some kind of chance, you know, random assortment, recombination, random fertilization. But if a population is really small, um, sometimes particular genes aren't passed on at all and they can actually disappear within that population. And this can happen um, really, you know, frequently when a larger population becomes small in a relatively short time frame. And we see this when we talk um, through populations that undergo the bottleneck effect or the founders effect. Now, the bottleneck effect occurs after a catastrophic event over, a, you know, of a long period of time. 
sorry, or a long period of time with adverse environmental conditions like earthquakes, volcano, you know, famine, drought, those kinds of things. And this drastically reduces the size of the population and therefore the alleles in the gene pool might be lost by chance. The population that grows out of this new smaller population can carry limited alleles in their gene pool, which isn't great for variation and survivability. So an example of this is the cheetah population on Earth. It faced a bottleneck due to climate change, to, to hunting um, and habitat destruction, and they've since only got a really small gene pool to reproduce within. So it compounds the problem of a lack of variation that they're all then just interbreeding with one another. The founder effect occurs in a really similar manner uh, to the bottleneck effect, but it occurs when a few individuals move to a new area and become geographically isolated from their larger population. And this makes the gene pool become really limited. So diversity decreases, and this means that you know, anything that's a detrimental, um, say, recessive allele that's sitting in their, in their gene pool is going to suddenly increase in frequency. So an example of this is the Amish community within the, within the US. It originally started with only about 200 people, and they don't bring in a lot of new recruits, so there's no gene flow in that small population. And given that one of the founders of the community has a syndrome known as Ellis Van Creveld syndrome, it's a rare recessive syndrome that leads to skeletal abnormalities and polydactyly, which is extra fingers and toes. There's a really high proportion of this syndrome found in the Amish community compared to, say, the wider population. Now, natural selection contributes to the frequencies of alleles in a population in a similar way to genetic drift, but the difference being that these changes are not random. That's why I'm bringing your attention to this part there. Now, where genetic drift can have alleles that are beneficial, detrimental, or completely neutral, just floating in and out with migration, the frequency of these ones in natural selection only changes. They only occur to better the biological fitness of a population to help them reproduce and help them survive. So remember that an individual doesn't undergo any uh, phenotype changes in its lifetime. It's all about those traits being passed on to the new uh, generation. So therefore, the frequency of alleles will change, but it's changing for the better. Now, organisms that are better adapted to their environment increase their chances of surviving and therefore reproducing. So when these favorable traits are selected for, right, by the environment, the next generation can inherit these alleles. And a selection pressure is a factor that influences the survival and the, um, you know, the reproductive success of the individual in a population, and these influence the allele frequencies. So the selection pressure might be resource availability, environmental conditions, pathogens, or another organism interaction like, say, predation. So an example of this in this beautiful BioNinja diagram shows that the beneficial trait for this organism is to be really easily camouflaged in its environment to avoid predators. But when more of the individuals without the beneficial phenotype get eaten, their chances of survival of the other butterfly actually increases. And because of this, it makes them more likely to be able to produce offspring, which makes sense, right? If there's more of you surviving, then they're the ones that are going to produce new offspring and therefore the traits or the allele frequencies in the next generation are going to be increased. And this actually occurred with the peppered moth uh, during the 1800s. The really dark phenotype had not been seen prior to this time, but when the Industrial Revolution began and pollutants began to enter the atmosphere, the trees were then part of that habitat, then darkened, and soon the really dark variety of the moth outnumbered the lighter coloured variety. And since the darker phenotype, um, you know, the darker phenotype, because of that trait, has become more suited to that environment. There's less likely to be preyed upon and therefore more likely to be able to reproduce to continue that species population. Another example of this um, is the use of antibiotics to kill off bacterial diseases, and these are creating a selection pressure for those bacteria that are actually immune to that antibiotic. Only the fittest, right, biologically fittest, survive, and therefore they reproduce. But this means that new strains of antibiotic-resistant bacteria are being discovered because they're the stronger ones that are then going on to reproduce. And whilst Darwin was out exploring the species of the world, he came across a selection of birds whilst in the Galapagos Islands, and he kept so many as specimens, and he noted that the birds were nearly all identical, except they had different beaks. Um, and they clearly had that selection pressure based on the food that they ate and the niche that they filled. And because their population was isolated 
on the islands and the Galapagos for so many years, they had accumulated all these tiny little changes in genotype and phenotype from their original ancestor. And that had formed new species different to that of the original common ancestor that had obviously flown across from South America to begin that population. Um, interesting to note that once we were able to genotype and better classify the types of birds that Darwin had as specimens, it turns out that not many of them are finches, even though they are referred to as Darwin's finches all the time. Okay, so we're looking to recognize natural selection occurs and we're looking at microevolutionary changes that are occurring through these types of mechanisms.